Okay, this is the final part of the Divinity Unveiled series. It's more of a final thought. Um, we've covered a lot of stuff over the weeks. And uh, let's just kind of bring it to a nice close. Um, one thing I will say, it's by no means exhaustive. We could go on and on and on and on about this, but I think we've covered enough to kind of make the main points. So let's bring it to a close. In the last part, we saw how the faith that was once monotheistic slowly changed over the course of 400 years. They went from worshipping God as one to two and finally three persons, all called God, or Elohim. Today, we bring this series to a close. Hopefully, we tie off some loose ends, but because of the nature of the discussion, there will always be loose ends. It's, it's one thing that I said at the very beginning of the series, I don't know if you guys remember, is that we will not have it all figured out, and you will more than likely still have questions by the end of it. And that's a good thing, because it shows how amazing our Creator truly is. But when the son of Adam, the son of Adam, sorry, comes, shall he find the belief on the earth? The, the belief, not any old belief. There's lots of faiths going on over, you know, Islam, Buddhism, Taoism, all the isms. But will he find the faith when he comes? And it, there's this idea of so doing. We have verses of will he find you so doing? This is why it's important to know what the faith of the apostles actually was, not the faith of the so-called church fathers. These church fathers, and I use that term very loosely, were, I'll say it, they were apostates. They taught lawlessness. They did away with the very signs of the covenant that we were ordered to keep as an everlasting inheritance. And it, 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 they're just completely veered off. In terms of divinity, here is the change that we saw. So this is kind of like, it's these diagrams that we did in part five. This was the beginning stage, monotheism. You have Yah and Yah alone. There is none else but me. He manifested himself through his word and through his spirit. There were manifestations of him. These two, the word and the spirit, created everything as we know it. And it was these two, and these two still, that continue to operate in our little thing called existence. Then we saw modalism. And modalism is very similar in that you have Yah and Yah alone. But all of a sudden, Yah manifests through Father, Son, and Spirit. Thus you have deposed the Father from being the Father. Now, these three created the world, and the Word and the Spirit manifest and interact and create what we know as. You can see how it's very similar to monotheism very similar, but when you see it in diagram form, it's actually quite a big change. You've deposed, do you see what I mean? It's similar, but not quite the same. Again, a little bit. This was Logos theology, so Justin Martyr, Tertullian, and the likes of such. So they said that there is Yah, and at some point before the creation of the world, his mind, his creative act, was manifested. And at first it was seen as equal. And at first it was seen as his mind. But when we shifted from Justin Martyr to Tertullian, these now became two separate entities. The thing that they, how they were able to hold to monotheism, monotheism is that you had two entities with the same stuff. There were God stuff, Elohim stuff, right? But there were two. So two entities, one God. And the spirit is what linked them. The word and the spirit created life and existence and then interacted with us. This is Logos theology, and you get varying versions of it. Whether you want to uh, make the, eventually the word, instead of it being manifested, became created. And then you had Origen's subordinate trinity, in that there was Yah the Father, the Father alone, and he created the Son, and then the Son created the Spirit. 
And then the Son and the Spirit, through the Word, created life. And then these two, the Son and the Spirit, interact in our domain. And then finally that led to what we now call Trinitarianism, which is this. Three separate, co-equal entities, all made of the same God stuff. So we've gone from one to two to three. Again, when the son of Adam comes, shall he find the belief on the earth? This is why it's important to know what the faith of the apostles actually was, not the faith of the so-called church fathers. Let's now go through some interesting passages of scripture. These are kind of the passages that I've probably missed along the way. And as the men's midrashes were going on during the progression of this series, some interesting points came across. So I felt it's time to maybe include these. Romans 9. Now, I've took the Berean Study Bible on this. You will see why in a bit. Uh, We're going to compare a few translations on a particular verse. This is Paul speaking. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying as confirmed by my conscience in the Holy Spirit. I have deep sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my own flesh and blood. He's speaking of then Israel, the Jewish people. So we actually see a a parallel to Moses here when he says, if you're not going to be with us, you know, block me out your book. The people of Israel, theirs is the adoption as sons, theirs the divine glory and the covenants, theirs the giving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and from them proceeds the human descent of Christ, who is God over all, forever worthy of praise. Amen. This is the verse now we're going to compare. This is a bold statement right there, that Christ, Messiah, Mashiach is Elohim over all. The Aramaic Bible in plain English agrees with this. It says, the Messiah appeared in the flesh, who is the God who is over all, to whom are praises and blessings of the, to eternity and of eternities, amen. Now this is, the Greek is actually a little ambiguous because this is what the King James puts. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So there's, there's been this debate ever since this was written. Is there like a, a break? Uh, so is it Christ who is God over all, or is it Christ that came in the flesh, blessed be God forever sort of thing? And if you read this, the academic stuff, they honestly say you could go either way. It, you, can't, you cannot tell from Paul's writings. It depends on your, I guess, your bias. Like I said, this verse has been the issue of much debate. This is why I wanted to show you the, very, the, the different, there's two ways of putting this. But I want to kind of show this in light of other things that Paul said. So in Titus 2, for the saving gift of Elohim has appeared to all men, instructing us to renounce wickedness and worldly lust and to live sensibly, righteously and reverently in the present age, looking for the blessed expectation and esteemed appearance of the great Elohim and our saviour Yeshua Messiah. Now, obviously, Paul would have been aware of Isaiah saying, there is no saviour but me, there is no Elohim but me. In Timothy 3, this again, beyond all question, the secret of reverence is great. You'll see in the King James, the secret of godliness. Who was revealed in the flesh, declared right in spirit, was seen by messengers, was proclaimed among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up into esteem. So Paul... Paul is actually very much open to your doctrinal bias. I'm going to be honest on this. Let's look at other scriptures. Let's look at Romans 1. We covered this in part 5. I think to me this is really an amazing passage. Therefore Elohim gave them up to the uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to disrespect their bodies among themselves, who changed the truth of Elohim into the falsehood and worshipped and served what was created rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. 
To me, this knocks out this idea that Yeshua, the word, is created as opposed to being brought forth. Because if you think that Yeshua, or the word, was created, you are now serving the created as opposed to the creator. Now, in Hebraic thinking, the creator was always uncreated. What was created is being contrasted with the creator. It's a contrast. If Elohim created everything by his word, the word was not created. It was brought forth. There's a difference. It's, it, it doesn't sound different, but theologically, there's a big impact. Remember what I said in part five, that initially, when the word was manifested, it was originally thought of the mind and creative power of Yah manifesting here in our domain. It was only until, say, 75 to 100 years later that then these became two separate individuals. The word is an intrinsic part of Elohim. To say that the word was created means to say that at some point, Yah did not have his word. To me, this is, that makes me very uncomfortable. Again, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. The word is an intrinsic part. Like, and what's interesting, when you read the writings of, like, especially the earliest ones, um, not Iranius, the one before Justin Martyr, the idea was that actually wisdom was, Yah created things by his word and by his wisdom. And we'll cover this a bit later, but to say that these things are created means to say that Yah didn't possess these things before. The word was thought of as Elohim's mind and wisdom. Are you going to tell me that Elohim had no mind and wisdom before he created it to then create everything? To say that the word was created is to say that Elohim had no mind and wisdom before the word. The difference between brought forth and created seems marginal, but to me the, the, the theological and doctrinal effect that has is huge. And they were stoning Stephen, Stephanos, as he was calling and saying, Master Yeshua, receive my spirit. And kneeling down, he cried out with a loud voice, Master, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Notice who he says, Master Yeshua, receive my spirit. In Psalm 31, 5, into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Yah, El of, the, El of truth. This is what Yeshua quotes on the cross. To my hands I commend my spirit. In Ecclesiastes 12, we read this. Remember also your creator. Singular, not creators. In the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Remember him before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the jar shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to Elohim who gave it. So, where's the spirit going? And Yah Elohim formed the man out of the dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, we covered this when we were looking at the Targums, that it was the word of the Lord that created man in his likeness. In the likeness of the presence of the Lord, he created him. The male and his yoke fellow, he created them. The presence of, he, we've been created in the presence of the Lord. Whose presence? Who gave the spirit of man? Who is your creator is what I'm asking you. Not we are your creators. <laughs> Who is your creator? Is it the word? Is it Yah? Is it two separate things? Exodus 19. And Yah said to Moshe, See, I am, I am coming to you in the thick cloud, so that the people hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. And Moshe reported the words of the people to Yah. 
The Targum said, the word of the Lord said to Moshe, behold, my word will be revealed to thee in the thickness of the cloud. Again, I will ask you the question. This was, the Targums were written before Messiah came. Were they now departing from monotheism? That the people may hear thee while I speak with thee, and so forth. Now in Acts chapter 7, this is Stephen, just before he gets stoned. This is the Moshe who said to the children of Israel, Yah, your Elohim, shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the messenger who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living words to give us. So who was it? Was it the word? Was it Yah or was it the messenger? Please bear in mind that Stephen is considered like the first generation of the assembly. Again, is he departing from the faith once given to him? Let's tie this to Nehemiah 9. This is Nehemiah speaking. You are Yah, the Elohim who chose Avram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Avraham and saw the affliction of our fathers in Mitzrayim and heard their cry by the Sea of Reeds and you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from the heavens and gave them straight right rulings of Torah of truth of good laws and commands. So where's Yah? He's come down and he spoke from the heavens. We have Yari, you could say, in two places at once, speaking from the heavens and on Mount Sinai. There are several instances of this happening in Scripture. Yah being in two places at once. When Abraham met with the three men, one of which was Yah. It's very clear, the text. When Abraham was meeting with Yah, was the throne now vacant? When Yah rains fire down from Yah in heaven, and the Targum says that it was the word raining fire down from Yah in the heavens. Again, were the Targumists binitarians? No, they were monotheists. The burning bush, Yah's in the bush. Again, is the throne vacant? The pillar of cloud and fire. If you read it, it says, and Yah moved behind them. When the 70 elders saw the Elohim of Israel, they see him, right? They see his feet and the pavement under it. And they're all amazed that they're still alive. Again, what, did Yah step down off his throne and then meet with them and then hurry on back up to sit back down? When Moshe saw Elohim's back, you go read, it says Yah. It doesn't say the word. It, doesn't, it says Yah. The Targum says it was his Shekhinah, his manifested presence. Again, when Yah was manifesting himself on earth, was the throne vacant? When we think of these things, Yah's in more than one place at once. To say that he cannot do this is to limit him. The presence of his glory in the tabernacle. You know, when Moshe is conversing and there was the glory cloud and also the temple, you know, when he goes into Solomon's temple, is the throne now vacant? Is it someone else? Because if, by definition, if that manifested presence is someone else, well, then it's not Yah. Is Yah now divided? Or is he one? Unified? Sometimes we seem to forget that Elohim transcends everything. We, we, one thing I've realized while going through this series is that our, our very own limitations of our minds actually affect our view of him. I've said that Yah can be more than one place at once. Scripture would agree. For is it true Elohim dwells on the earth? See the heavens... See, he doesn't say another Elohim. They're they're on about the one Elohim, right? The one true Elohim that deserves worship. See, the heavens and heavens of the earth are unable to contain you. You, how much less this house which I have built. They didn't think it was someone else inhabiting that temple. It was Yah inhabiting that temple. Yet, 
He cannot be contained. The throne is not vacant. In Jeremiah, if anyone is hidden in the secret places, would I not see him, declares Yah? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? He's in two places. The heavens, he fills the heavens and the earth. We read right over these things. It sounds good and poetic. He just says, do I not fill the heavens and the earth? And it doesn't matter whether you believe in flat earth or globe earth. He, he's in two places at once. Psalm 139, I love this psalm. Where would I go from your spirit? Or where would I flee from your face? Again, what have we covered? The angel of his presence. The Hebrew says, Malach Panei, Panim, the angel of his face. If I, if I go up in the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, see, you are there. I take the wings of the morning, I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. There too your hand would lead me and your right hand hold me. He's everywhere. You know, we, see, we read that the eyes of Yah are everywhere. He sees everything. Let's look at Zechariah 14. I think this, this is an amazing chapter, especially when you start threading it with all the parallel a lot happens in Zechariah 14 that like mirrors other passages in the scripture. And when you bring all these things, they synergize into this amazing picture. Let's look at this. See, a day shall come from Yah, and your spoil shall be divided in your midst. And Yah shall go forth, and he shall fight against those Gentiles as he fights in the day of battle. Isaiah 63 tells us more about this. Who is this coming from Edom? With garments of glowing colours from Basra, who is robed in splendour, striding forward in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save, to deliver. Why is there red on your raiment and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. And I trod them down in my displeasure... And I trampled them in my wrath. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have defiled all my raiment. Revelation 19 gives us Q and A, please. This is fulfilled in Revelation 19. And having been dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of Yah. And the armies in the heaven dressed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword that he should smite the nations. And he shall shepherd them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of El Shaddai. So let's link this back to Zechariah 14. Yah shall go forth. Revelation says the word of Yah. Are we talking two separate individuals? No, it's the same individual. How can the word and Yah both be called the word of Yah? The word was Yah, the word was with Yah. And in that day, his feet shall stand upon the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem to the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move toward the, na the north and half of it toward the south. We covered this recently in Acts. And as they were gazing into the heavens, as he went up, speaking of Yeshua, see two men stood by them dressed in white, who also said, men of Galil, why do you stand up looking into the heaven? This same Yeshua, who was taken up from you into heaven, shall come in the same way as you saw him go into the heaven. We find out that this happened at the Mount of Olives. So again... Yeshua is going to come back from the sky, touch the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 tells us that this was Yah. So by putting these two things, Yeshua is Yah. We'll get to this thing, is, is there more than one Yah? 
And you shall flee to the valley of my mountain, for the valley of the mountains reached to Atzal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, sovereign of Yehuda. And Yah my Elohim shall come, all the set apart ones with you. Again, this is fulfilled in Revelation 19. Who's, um, having been dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, his name is called the word of Yah, the armies in the heaven dressed in fine white linen, followed him on white horses. These are the set-apart ones coming with Yah my Elohim. And Yah shall be sovereign over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Yah and his name one. Deuteronomy picks up on this. Here are Yisrael, Yah our Elohim, Yah is one. Now in Joel... It shall be that everyone who calls on the name of Yah shall be delivered or saved. For on Mount Zion in Jerusalem there shall be an escape, as Yah has said, and among the survivors whom Yah calls. So far, so good. This is Peter speaking. If today we are called to account for a good deed towards a sick man by whom he has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that in the name of Yeshua Messiah of Nazareth, whom you impaled, whom Elohim raised from the dead, by him this one stands before you healthy. And there is no deliverance in anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven given among by men by which we need to be saved. I thought there was only going to be one Yah and his name one, and they shall call on the name of Yah and Joel to be saved. Is what Peter's saying contradictory? There, apparently, there's no other name. Well, I'm seeing Yeshua, I'm seeing Yah. Just on a, very, less, on a very simplistic level, Yeshua and Yah. This is Exodus 23, and all that I have said to you take heed and make no mention of the name of other mighty ones let it not be heard from your mouth we have to do you see what I'm saying Yah says there will be one name there is no other name and then Peter's saying well actually it's the name of Yeshua are we now speaking the name of another mighty one on our lips is what I'm asking this is a question worth asking this is what Judaism will tell you you are quoting another name and this is where Christians, they don't know how to answer this. This is why I said this can either strengthen your faith in your Messiah or destroy it. This teaching can be dangerous for some. Let's keep going. It shall be that all who are left from all the Gentiles which come up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to bow themselves to the sovereign, the king, Yah of hosts, and to observe the festival of booths. And it shall be that if any one of the clans of the earth does not come up to Jerusalem to bow himself to the sovereign, Yah of hosts, on them there is no rain. So Yah is reigning in Jerusalem. He is the king. In John, Nathaniel, Nathanel answered to him and said, Rabbi, you are the son of Elohim. You are the sovereign of Yisrael. Again, is Nathaniel saying that there is now another king on the throne. Bear in mind, Yeshua was not king at that time. He was just a rabbi going around teaching. Just some guy. But he says, no, you are the sovereign of Yisrael. Is Nathaniel now worshipping a different god? Because Zechariah is very clear that that king is called Yah of hosts. And having been dressed in a robe dipped in blood, his name is called the word of Yah. And on his robe and on his banner, he has a name written, King of Kings and Master of Masters, Lord of Lords. Again, if, if there is the Father and then there is the Son, but he's, the Son is now the King of Kings, but there's a King above him. King of Kings and Master of Masters of all. Again, who is the King? Who is your King, I would ask? For a child shall be born unto us, a son shall be given unto us, and the rule on his shoulder, and his name is called Wonder Counselor, Strong El. It says El Gibor, Mighty God, will be the modern lingo of it. 
Father of continuity, Aviad. Father of eternity is a better translation. Father of eternity, Prince of peace. Of the increase of his rule and peace, there is no end. There is no end of the rule of the Son. Who shall be born unto us? Isaiah is very clear. Now, how do we marry this with what Paul says? For since death came through, since death is through a man, and the resurrection of the dead is also through a man. For as all die in Adam, so all shall also be made alive in Messiah. And each one to his own order, Messiah the first fruits, then those who are of Messiah at his coming. Then the end, when he delivers up the reign to Elohim the Father, when he has brought to naught all rule and all authority and power. Can we agree that Yeshua was the fulfillment of Isaiah, what we've just read? Why is his reign now coming to an end? For he has to reign until he has to put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be brought to naught is death. For he has to put all under his feet. But when he says all are put under him, it is clear that he who put all under him is to be expected. And when all are made subject to him, then the son himself shall also be subject to him who put all under him. In all that Elohim be all in all. Now, again, is Paul contradicting Isaiah? Because Paul thought that he would have thought that Yeshua would have been the fulfillment of Isaiah, of whose rule there is no end. So how do we deal with this? Is Paul talking out of both sides of his mouth? You know in John when it says, we don't know what he is, but when he reveals himself, we shall be as he is, and then we'll see him fully as he is. I used to think that that was beginning of the millennium. Going through this series, I think this is end of the millennium. We will see him as he is. When Elohim shall wipe every tear from our eyes. Is Shaul now contradicting Isaiah? It would, on face value, it would seem so. Again, this is why people are very quick to toss Paul out. The only way this can be reconciled is if Yeshua is young. And by these verses. Let's remember that the, Yeshua was the word the manifestation of Elohim's mind, his creative power. Dare I say it, um, a personification. Remember, Hebraic thought loves to personify abstract concepts. This can only be reconciled if there shall be one sovereign over the earth, and that day there shall be one Yah and his name one. There is no deliverance in anyone else, for there is no other name under heaven. Is Yeshua's name and Yah's name now different? I, I am Yah, and besides me, there is no saviour. For act, just for Acts 4 to reconcile Isaiah 43, they need to be, Yeshua needs to be Yah. Or just rip out Acts. Joel 2, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of Yah shall be delivered. Peter says it's the name of Yeshua. Keep going. I'm going to wrap this up now. I am Yah. That is my name, and my esteem I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. How do we reconcile this with verses that say that the Father has given Yeshua a name above all names? We have to be honest with these things. I, I am Yah, besides me there is no saviour. I have declared and saved and made known and there was no foreign mighty one among you. You are my witnesses, declares Yah, the IML. To me, th- these verses that we're going to kind of go through show that there is only one. They can't be, like, because no matter how you look at it, if, if we believe in Father and Son as completely two separate things, well then the Son is essentially saying, I am Yah, that's my name, my esteem I don't give to any other, but yet then at the end of the age, I'm going to give the kingdom over to the Father and then subserve to him. How do we reconcile Paul with that? Because if he doesn't give his glory to another, well then the son serving... Do you see what I'm trying to say? Thus said Yah, sovereign of Israel. Sovereign of Israel. What did Nathaniel say? You, Rabbi, a sovereign of Israel. 
and his redeemer, Yah of hosts. So Yah is the sovereign of Israel and the redeemer of Israel. I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no Elohim. This, and one of the things that came up in our midrashes was the, the divine counsel that there are other Elohim in terms of judge. The people like the principalities, right? They rule and judge over regions and things. This is not speaking of small case Elohim, should we say, right? There is no other Elohim like me. I have my judges, I have my divine counsel, but I, Yah, am the one that needs to be worshipped. The problem is, is that people did start worshipping the divine counsel. What has Moshe said? They were offering things to demons. Is there an Eloa, a God, besides me? There is, this is amazing, there is no other rock. I know not one. Who's the rock of our faith, right? We've got these things. Paul even says that Yeshua was, Messiah was the rock that followed them in the wilderness. At the very least, Yeshua is Yah. On the, when you start marrying these things together, thus says Yah, your Redeemer. Again, what are we redeemed by? The blood of the Lamb. But Yah is my Redeemer. And he who formed you from the womb, who created man? Yah, the Word. I am Yah, doing all, stretching out the heavens all alone. Spreading out the earth with none beside me. Now this is interesting because in Proverbs we read this, speaking of wisdom. Then I was beside him a master workman. How, we're not even in the New Testament yet. And I was his delight day by day rejoicing before him all the time. Is there a difference? Is there now a contradiction? Because Isaiah, there's none beside me. And Proverbs is like, yeah, wisdom was there beside me. This goes to show that wisdom, it was Yah's wisdom personified. If you want to say that that's the word, that means that the word is one with Yah. Because there's, there, I, he, there was none beside me. Again, this is a person, Proverbs 8 is a personification of an abstract thought. This shows us that the wisdom or the word is Yah himself, not some other person. It has to, to reconcile those two scriptures, that's how it has to be. Elohim always had his wisdom and his word, always. He didn't just pop them out and go, all right, now I have wisdom in my word and now I can create. I am Yah and there is none else, not below me, not above me. There is no Elohim besides me. I gird you though you have not known me, so that they know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none but me. I am Yah, and there is none else. Forming light and creating darkness, making peace and creating evil. I, Yah, do all these. I know I'm, I'm going on, but when there's repetition, I, we're told to you know, listen up. For thus says Yah, creator of the heavens, he is Elohim, former of the earth and its maker, he established it, he did not create it to be in empty, he formed it to be inhabited. I am Yah, there is none else. Again, how do we reconcile that to Proverbs 8 with wisdom or the word there beside it? Declare and bring near. Let them even take counsel together. Who has announced this from old? Who has declared it from that time? Is it not I, Yah? And there is no mighty one beside me. A righteous El and a saviour, there is none besides me. A righteous El and a saviour, a deliverer, there is none besides me. How do you reconcile this with Yeshua? And if that's the son speaking there... Well, how is there one above him? Turn to me and be saved. All you ends of the earth, for I am El and there is none else. Again, how do we reconcile this with what Peter said? There is no other name under the heavens. Remember the former events of old, for I am El and there is none else. Elohim and there is none like me. There isn't even one like him. 
If that's the son and there's a father above him, there's someone like him. If they're made of the same stuff, right? That's what the teaching says. There's two made of the same stuff. Well, then there is one like him. Who is your Elohim? This is what Judaism would say to Christianity. Who's your Elohim? Do you worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Oh, you do. Funny that. You're doing everything else that says that you don't. Who is your creator? There's only one creator. There is only one. Isaiah just went ad nauseum to say this. Who's your creator? Who is your saviour? Who are you putting your eternal livelihood in the hands of? Final thoughts of the final thoughts, right? I think it's pretty clear to say that Yeshua is divine. You, you cannot get away. You can't read all the scriptures and go through this series and say, well, oh, he was just a man. And he wasn't pre-existent, like... Even the New Testament would disagree with that. He is the word of Yah, and the word was not created. It was manifested. Big difference. Big difference. His creative capability, his mind, his will manifested. He is the manifestation of Yah in our world and domain. We, you, please, we don't get to see him in full glory. And but from Revelation, we don't get to see that full glory until after the millennium. What do we have? We have a dimmed, veiled, shrouded form. Until then. You probably still have more questions or rebuttals either. Doesn't matter. I said this would happen. I said this would happen. Don't expect me to spoon feed you all the answers and to connect all your dots for you. We are trying to comprehend the incomprehensible. We're going to have differences of opinion on this. It's okay. What we can't do is deny the blood that bought us and take away his divinity. Oh no, we cannot do that. Speaking of incomprehensible, and the messenger of Yah said to him, why do you ask my name since it is wondrous? You cannot comprehend it. You cannot begin to fathom my name, my authority. And his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, having a name that had been written, which no one perceived except for himself. You can't even... You know when Paul says, no eye, no ears, can even begin to imagine these things. Beloved ones... Now we are children of Elohim, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Like I said, I used to think that was pre-millennial. I now think it's post. When we see Elohim fully as he is. Yet people bicker and argue over the incomprehensible. It's okay to have differences, you know, we can talk our differences out and... Sometimes use the same scripture to come to slightly different conclusions. But let's, let's be honest. Are we now trying to fit Elohim in our little box? What I said at the beginning of the series was, we're not going to answer all the questions, but hopefully understand them at least a little better. Many lives have actually been lost over the ages due to this, the arguing and the bickering. In part five, we had that quote that said that in that, them two periods, more Christians kill Christians than the rest of pagan persecution on them. I mean, that's an amazing thing to be just... Does this even remotely please Elohim? When you read Proverbs, it says seven things he hates, right? And one of them is strife and division in the body. He hates it. There's a difference between dividing over, you know blatant sin and casting blatant sin out but doctrinal positions on the incomprehensible let's remember what this series was about initially it wasn't even about 
Let's try to figure Elohim out. That wasn't the aim of this. The aim is about putting Yeshua back on the throne. Why? Because look out there. People are denying him left, right, and center. That's why we did this. Let's put Yeshua back on the throne. The throne that is rightfully his. It belongs to him. And last time I checked, there's only one throne. I hope this series has been a blessing or a good check of what do you actually believe? Because sometimes we believe things very glibly. We just, oh yeah, I believe it. And we don't actually stop and assess why we believe these things. Even if you come out at the end of this series with a different opinion, good. Because at least you know what you believe and why you believe it. The thing is, is can we do this journey side by side and walk it out? Amen.